The Unbreakable Code by Sarah Hoagland Hunter Illustrated by Julia Minor John raced up the trail, sending pebbles skidding behind him. When he reached his favorite hiding place, he fell to the ground out of breath. Here, between the old pignon trees and the towering walls of the canyon, he felt safe. The river full of late summer rain looked like a silver thread winding through his grandfather's farmland. They would be looking for him now, but he was never coming down. His mother had married the man from Minnesota. There was nothing he could do about that. But he was not going with them. He closed his eyes and rested in the stillness. The faint bleat of a mountain goat echoed off the canyon walls. Suddenly, a voice boomed above him. Shouldn't you be packing? John's eyes flew open. It was his grandfather on horseback. Your stepfather's coming with the pickup in an hour. I'm not going, John said. You have to go. School's starting soon, said Grandfather, stepping down from his horse. You'll be back next summer. John dug his toe deeper into the dirt. I want to stay with you, he said. Grandfather's soft brown eyes disappeared in the wrinkles of a smile. John thought they were the kindest eyes he had ever seen. You're going to be all right, Grandfather said. You have an unbreakable code. What's that? asked John. Grandfather sat down and began to speak gently in Navajo. The sounds wove up and down, in and out, as warm and familiar as the patterns of one of his grandmother's Navajo blankets. John leaned his head against his grandfather's knee. The unbreakable code is what saved my life in World War II, he said. It's the Navajo language. John's shoulders sagged. Navajo couldn't help him. Nobody in his new school spoke Navajo. I'll probably forget how to speak Navajo, he whispered. Navajo is your language, said his grandfather sternly. Navajo you must never forget. The lump in John's throat was close to a sob. You don't know what it's like there, he said. His grandfather continued quietly in Navajo. I had to go to a government boarding school when I was five. It was the law. They gave me an English name and cut my hair off. I wasn't allowed to speak my language. Anyone who spoke Navajo had to chew on squares of soap. Believe me, I chewed a lot of soap during those years. Speak English, they said, but Navajo was my language, and Navajo I would never forget. Every summer, I went home to herd the sheep and help with the crops. I cried when the cottonwood turned gold, and it was time to go back. Finally, one night, in the tenth grade, I was working in the kitchen when I heard a bulletin on the school radio. Navajos needed for special duty to the Marines. Must be between the ages of 17 and 32, fluent in English and Navajo, and in excellent physical condition. Just before lights out, I snuck past the bunks and out the door toward the open plain. I felt like a wild horse with the lasso finally off its neck. Out in the open, the stars danced above me, and the tumbleweeds bloomed by my feet as I ran. The next day, I enlisted. But you weren't seventeen, said John. The reservation had no birth records, Grandfather said with a grin. Two weeks later, I was on a bus headed for boot camp with twenty-eight other Navajos. I stared out the window into the darkness. 
I was going outside of the four sacred mountains for the first time in my life. Were you scared? asked John. Of course, said his grandfather. I didn't know where I was going, or what our special mission was. Most of all, I didn't know how I would measure up to the people out there I had heard so much about. How did you? asked John, chewing his fingernail. His grandfather began to laugh. We were known as the toughest platoon at boot camp. We had done so much marching and boarding school that the drills were no problem. Hiking in the desert of California with a heavy pack was no worse than hauling water in the canyon in midsummer. And I'd done that since I was four years old. As for survival exercises, we had all gone without food for a few days. A Navajo learns to survive. One weekend, they bust us to a new camp in San Diego. On Monday, we were marched to a building with bars on every window. They locked us in a classroom at the end of a long, narrow corridor. An officer told us our mission was top secret. We would not even be allowed to tell our families. We were desperately needed for a successful invasion of the Pacific Islands. So far, the Japanese had been able to intercept and decode all American radio messages in only minutes. This meant that no information could be passed between American ships, planes, and land forces. The government thought the Navajo language might be the secret weapon. Only a few outsiders had ever learned it. Most importantly, the language had never been written down. So there was no alphabet for the Japanese to discover and decode. He gave us a list of more than 200 military terms to code. Everything had to be memorized. No trace of the code could ever be found in writing. It would live or die with us in battle. When the officer walked out of the room, I looked at the Navajo next to me and began to laugh. All those years they told us to forget Navajo, and now the government needs it to save the country. We were marched every day to that classroom. We were never allowed to leave the building. We couldn't even use the bathroom by ourselves. Each night, an officer locked our notes in a safe. The code had to be simple and fast. We would have only one chance to send each message. After that, the Japanese would be tracing our location to bomb us or trying to record the code. We chose words from nature that would be easy to remember under fire. Since Navajo has no alphabet, we made up our own. A became Wolache. Ant? asked John in English. Grandfather nodded. B was Shuj. Bear, said John. C was Mose. D, Be. E, Ze. His grandfather continued to the alphabet. Each time he named the Navajo word, John answered with the English. We named the aircraft after birds. The dive bomber was a chicken hawk. The observation plane was an owl. A patrol plane was a crow. Bomber was buzzard. At night, we would lie in our bunks and test each other. Pretty soon, I was dreaming in code. Since we would be radio men, we had to learn all kinds of radio operations. We were taught how to take a radio apart and put it together in total darkness. The Japanese fought at night, so we would have to do most of our work in complete darkness. Even the tiniest match flame could be a target. When the day came for the code to be tested in front of the top marine officers, I was terrified. I knelt at one end of the field with our radio ground set. The officers marched toward me. Behind a building at the other end of the field, another code talker sat under military guard, waiting for my transmission. One officer handed me a written message. Receiving steady machine gun fire. Request reinforcements. It took only seconds for me to speak into the microphone in Navajo code. The officer sent a runner to the end of the field to check the speed and accuracy of the message. The Navajo at the other end handed him the exact message written in English before he even came around a corner of the building. They tested us over and over. Each time, we were successful. The government requested 200 Navajo recruits immediately. Two of our groups stayed behind to train them. 
The rest of us were on our way. Tell me about the fighting, said John. Suddenly, Grandfather's face looked as creased and battered as the canyon walls behind him. After a long pause, he said, What I saw is better left back there. I would not want to touch my home or my family with those pictures. Before we invaded, I looked out at that island. It had been flattened and burned. Let this never happen to a beautiful island again, I thought. I just stayed on the deck of the ship thinking about the ceremonies they were doing for me at home. We invaded at dawn. I almost drowned in a bomb crater before I even got to shore. I was trying to run through the water and the bullets when I felt myself sinking into a bottomless hole. My 80-pound radio pack pulled me straight down. I lost my rifle paddling to the surface. On the beach, it was all I could do just to survive. I remember lying there with gunfire flying past my ears. A creek that ran to the beach was clear when I first lay there. By noon, it was blood red. The worst were the fallen soldiers I had to run over to go forward. I couldn't even stop to say I was sorry. I just had to run over them and keep going. I had to move through the jungle at night, broadcasting in code from different locations. One unit needed medical supplies. Another needed machine gun support. I had just begun broadcasting to another co-talker. Arizona, New Mexico, I called. The next thing I knew, an American soldier behind me was yelling, Do you know what we do to spies? Don't shoot, I said. I'm American. Look at my uniform. He didn't believe me. He had heard the foreign language. He had seen my hair and eyes. Japanese spies had been known to steal uniforms from fallen American soldiers. One of my buddies jumped out of the bushes right at that moment and saved my life. How did you stay alive the rest of the time? asked John. My belief was my shield, Grandfather answered. He drew a ragged wallet from deep inside of his shirt pocket. Inside of this, I carried corn pollen from the medicine man. Never be afraid, he said. Nothing's going to touch you. And nothing ever did. More than 400 code talkers fought in some of the bloodiest battles of World War II. All but a few of us survived. The Japanese never did crack the code. When they finally discovered what language it was, they captured and tortured one poor Navajo. He wasn't a code talker and couldn't understand the message they had intercepted. He told them we were talking about what we ate for breakfast. Our code word for bombs was eggs. Six months before the war ended, Navajo code talkers passed more than 800 messages in two days during the invasion of Iwo Jima. When the American flag was raised over the top of Iwo Jima's mountain, the victory was announced in code to the American fleet. Sheep, uncle, ram, ice, bear, ant, cat, horse, itch, came the code. John tried to spell out the letters. Suribachi, asked John. Yes, said Grandfather, Mount Suribachi. When I came home, I walked the 12 miles from the bus station to this spot. There weren't any parades or parties. I knew I wasn't allowed to tell anyone about the code. I looked down at that beautiful canyon floor and thought, I am never leaving again. But why did you leave in the first place? asked John. His grandfather lifted him gently onto the horse. The answer to that is in the code, he said. The code name for America was our mother. You fight for what you love. You fight for what is yours. He swung his leg behind John and reached around him to hold the reins. Keep my wallet, he said. It will remind you of the unbreakable code that once saved your country. John clutched the wallet with one hand and held the horse's mane with the other. He wasn't as scared of going to a new place anymore. His grandfather had taught him who he was and what he would always have with him. 
He was the grandson of a Navajo code talker, and he had a language that had once helped save his country. The end.